Okay, so thanks so much Charlotte and thank you everyone for coming and also to Sarah in particular for agreeing to respond to this paper despite all the demands at the beginning of term. It's great to start the term with you here in the same room together. But I also want, before I start, just to acknowledge a few other people beyond Philip Ogden himself, who in various places in the world have been decisive in this relationship with Queen Mary University of London. So Philip Ogden, of course, as, as Charlotte has said, Emeritus Professor of Geography, but also um, another key architect in the ulip Queen Mary relationship would be Professor Morag Shiech. Um, who was a really great supporter of this situation uh, a number of years ago, in fact. And then also some of our friends and colleagues from history, Mary Rubin, Julian Jackson, Colin Jones, and more recently Hannah Williams and Andrew Mendelssohn, all of whom I think would have liked to have been here as well. Um, and equally from geography, Alison Blunt, Reagan Koch, Alistair Owen, and of course, Engen Eisen, Nivi Manchanda, and Peter Brett. So what I'm doing is just kind of bringing some of these people into the space as well, sending out a wave to them, and, uh, and also welcoming you all here with them in mind too. But to get to the paper itself, whose fixation on point de fixation? A woman, incandescent in the early morning sun, yanking an empty shopping cart behind her, marches up to the table that is set in the street in the heart of Stalingrad Chapelle behind the Gare du Nord. A table such as this one has been set up here and on different streets and corners within this small perimeter in one of the densest and poorest districts of Paris, day in, day out now since 2016, whatever the weather and through the various phases of lockdown. On the table are the last offerings of a free breakfast, a group of four policemen are standing by and a small crowd of people are still milling around, drinking coffee, passing the time. Some are dancing. The permanence choreographique de la chapelle has tied some coloured banners between trees and railings. And there are a group of ten or so people, more or less itinerant, who are creating a dance that writes, We are the future, in farci, in movements in the air. The woman leans in. You've got to stop, she says pointing her finger. Now, you've got to stop. Il faut arrêter. Il faut que ça s'arrête. Vous pensez faire une belle action, mais vous fixez la merde. Vous fixez la merde dans ce quartier. You are creating a point of fixation. She continues in a pained, generalized interpolation, casting around for anyone who will listen, who will hear the, feel, the fear she feels for her children, the cleaning job she does, the rent she pays to keep it together, in an area whose most recent claim to singularity is being the biggest hotspot of open crack cocaine consumption in Western Europe. Another woman standing next to me, her hand resting proprietorially on a large thermos of coffee, a familiar face too around this mobile table, also local, similar age, leans towards her angry opposite. But you're wrong, madame, she says. Vous vous trompez. Nous, c'est pour les réfugiés qu'on est là. If we're here, she says, it's because of the refugees. You know, from Sudan, Afghanistan, you know, where the Taliban, she says. The others, the crack users, they're here by chance. If we're here, it's because the refugees are here. And the police, well, they look on, without looking anywhere in particular, gaze trained to assess a situation, to avoid eye contact. One or two unstable people in the mix don't make a crack contingent. A disparate group of young men with rucksacks and worn-out trainers don't make a migrant camp. A breakfast in the street doesn't constitute civil disobedience. Until it does, and then they know that they hold all the cards. The woman behind the table continues, determined to bring the other round. You should come, she says. Come and help. You'll see. This is a good thing. People speak to one another here. If this goes on, if they stay, pulling us all down, the other replies. She'll have no choice but to come to the breakfast. The tone rises and falls, the dance continues, the gestures are bigger and bigger, then the group moves on. This was last Saturday, 25th of September, on the Rue d'Aubervilliers, the day after 200 police were deployed to forcibly remove the hub of consumption and drug dealing that has dramatically rekindled the language of fixation, fixation in reference to this sector of Paris. <coughs> this most recent intervention comes after a succession of measures over the past months and years 
that have already dispersed this and other unstable camps of radically diminished people, many of whom are migrants in the sense that before labeled as crack addicts, they are already the racialized abject others of contemporary immigration regimes. The accusation of creating a point de fixation could have come at any number of other moments in the streets of La Chapelle. And it will be my claim here that it can also speak to the dynamics and conditions evident in other places likewise identified as point de fixation. So this is perhaps one way of expressing the structural offerings that this paper has to make, which I can expand as, follow, as follows. Any, another, any number of other moments or an attempt to understand some sort of longer temporal sequence through the discourse on point de fixation in a bid to parry the now well acknowledged limitations of the refugee crisis narrative. A number of other places or a bid to speak from within the thick everydayness of a node or a choke point towards points of commonality, yet wary of predicating exemplarity. I'm speaking then about the point de fixation against a pervasive discourse of crisis and from within an experience of crisis. An experience of crisis, moreover, which feels that its disarray is part of what can help us grasp a different map of Europe, both as continent and political project, and which feels this feeling as some sort of suture between the horrific violence that is enacted in the catastrophic political standoff over this scène ouverte, or open stage of crack usage, between the arm of the state, the préfecture, and the voice of the city, the mairie, but also in the somber stalemate between the two women, unable to find any common ground across the breakfast table. That is, as some sort of suture between the glaring light of media simplicity and unprecedented policing that has drawn a contour around a group of people, les craqueurs, in ways equivalent to the equally stigmatized category of les migrants, and the difficult dailiness of hearing one another across our entangled existences in our proximities. But that was also what was unbearable, catastrophic, about the events of last weekend. Not just having to stand by as the police demonstrate their power to empty public space, or indeed to decree that a given space at Porte de la Villette, 15 minutes away, is already empty, and then to build a wall to block it off in another iteration of a familiar scenario. But also to feel how the irritation of being called out on a Sunday, sunny morning when dancing was possible with the accusation, you are creating a point of fixation. How that, how that kind of accusation cannot but slide towards a sense of inadequacy and shame too, that was mine in the impossibility of speaking with that woman. And if I'm speaking of point de fixation here, now, with the reprieve and the sustaining reception that this environment and you afford, it is first and foremost, I think, in an attempt to loosen that sense of impasse, although it is also to make the discourse of the point de fixation speak to different ends than those of the police and the media. So to persist to the end of this preamble, I'm not only speaking about or of, but also from within a state of relative fixation or impasse, able for sure to renounce this research topic, to leave it to the social sciences, perhaps, as I and all those others who do things like gather to redistribute food, or to assist in securing a person's rights, or to share a life project, could abandon the stakes to more competent entities, and yet compelled, for reasons that often feel obscure, to stay the distance. My point is that there can be no talking about fixations without asking how our politics are caught in the glue of our attachments, the obsessions and contingencies that make up a life, and that to do that is already to seek channels more subterranean than the paradigms of agency are prone to catch, though it will still be questioned in this paper of actions engaged and cultivated. But let me try to be a bit more programmatic, 
But first, before I do that, I want to allow myself the brief, brief parenthesis that in this navigation of critique within pragmatic horizons, that is, in facing the still vexed question of the relation between academic and activist work, it is to feminist thinkers such as Jacqueline Rose, <coughs> Lauren Ballant, Wendy Brown, that I look. And as I go forward, I'm going to be using the slides today basically to give, to map out some bibliographical references for this work, and that's essentially all I'll be doing with the slides. So what do I mean here, then, in this lineage by attachments? What are some of the fixations operating in the scene that I've only just indicated for the moment? By, by asking that question, the next, the next phase of my paper aims to encounter the border, not as it stretches between territories in more or less stable, more or less visible form, but as it occurs in language, in the occasion or enunciation of this expression, point de fixation. In other words, to claim that to see contemporary board bordering, we also need to look through the prism of language to see the divisive meanings and sticking points clustering around the locution, point de fixation, which tell us something of the pitfalls operating in migration studies and activism. Not with a view necessarily to dismissing them, though the wish to do so might be overpowering at times, rather to stay with their obduracy, to stay with what's there in the point de fixation, with its obstinacy. And the reason for doing this, doing this in the longer scheme of things is that the possibility of a longer scheme of things in this context is what is most pressing. What does it mean for an activist scene that may not quite be a movement to hold together? How does it do something other than just reproduce itself? How does its holding together relate to other scenes, both in the past and in other places? These are not just my questions, I think they're versions of the questions I hear most urgently at the moment, both across the literature and in the street. So I've just referred to the point de fixation as a locution, a fixed expression, identifiable across a range of discourses linking the sociology of drugs and youth delinquency in the 1990s to prostitution, to informal markets selling contraband cigarettes and food, to migrant camps and squats, and to the increasing concentration of all of these activities in the case of the zone I'm discussing here, which I'll call La Chapelle, because that is the appellation I hear most often around me. The longevity of the expression point de fixation is important, and I want to double back too to what was the beginning for me in this adventure, which was the work on Jean Poulon, proto-ethnographer, surrealist writer, art critic, an omnipotent editor in the mid-20th century. Poulon was obsessed with fixed locutions and with their capacity, he claimed, in the crisis-ridden years of the 1930s to pinpoint a blockage, an aporia in the language of the day. He referred to this as the power of words, the power to both intensify impossibility, <coughs> to make us shudder in disbelief at the other's failure to adhere to the evidence of a pronouncement, and still to offer the means of restoring the capacity to speak together. He saw these locutions as offering a discursive repertoire, typified for him by the proverbial speech practiced by the Malagasy people in Madagascar, which has both the capacity to trouble its locutors with its relative obscurity, its mere flickers of significance that don't resolve into full-blown assertion, and yet to entertain our willingness to go along, to keep talking. In addition to Poulon, I'm grateful here to Juliette de Laplace of the Soukou Catholique in Kelly, who just last week, when asked officially on a stage by the anthropologist Alexandra Galitsin Moupe for just one word that would sum up the past five years of working in solidarity with people in Kelly, immediately said, les points de fixation which she went on to describe as a euphemism, an empty expression for la chasse à l'homme, or the tracking down of people. And I'm grateful too to François Héron, Chair of Migration Studies at the Collège de France, eminent demographer, who equally spontaneously glossed Juliette's answer with the explanation that locus, locution figée 
are arguments within discourse, flipping Juliette's anger at the non-significance of these expressions, which means they can't be grasped, into the counterclaim that they signify more and add unsuspected ballast to a position, making it difficult to shift. Pollan in Madagascar, L'Accueil de Jour in Calais, the Collège de France, my discursive mapping of the point de fixation is intentionally all over the place. And I could cite too, in very recent pronouncements, the Prefect of Paris, the Mayor of Paris, um, all number of reportages which have used this notion of the point de fixation or of an aimant, a kind of magnet, as well, of course, as my comrades, my camarades of the Nord-Est Parisien, which take me back to the Rue d'Aubervilliers and that accusation and the excess and absence of meaning convened across the breakfast table. The aporia or interruption in communicability that made for such a sterile accusation and counter-accusation between two women who surely have more <clears throat> to share. So this is my first pitch. I think the point de fixation could be a resource for us, not because it is an argument as such, but because it gathers meanings to it even while it prevents us from seeing them. So what other meanings are lurking here that the aporia or our fixation with a fixed expression prevents us from seeing? I might start with the category of refugee and the casual hierarchization of human life spoken across the table last Saturday when the woman behind the thermos reduced the addicts to accidental presences. So much good scholarship has argued and I'll only invoke that, led by Michel Agier and those working around him. So much, this the, the scholarship has argued that it is an impasse, precisely, to take up the pre-given or state-generated categories, figures presumed stable and discreet, typified recently also in the good refugees, bad economic migrants distinction made by Macron. Easy to denounce when it is in the mouth of a president ramified by his sense of sovereign destiny. Such identity constructs nonetheless remain the starting point in much migration-related work. And though few who, free, who are frequently around that table on the Rue d'Aubervilliers would stand for long by that sort of differentiation, the exacerbation of unmoving immiseration caused by the spread of crack cocaine in and around La Chapelle has thrown into sharp relief the way a posture anchored in hospitality gets caught in a feedback loop whereby it hears itself only in relation to what it perceives as the problem, i.e. the hostility of the state, a hostility or a problem, moreover, which it fixates on as in some sense our failures, Europe's failure, while the spread of addiction is seen as an accident in an individual pathway. Part of what is at stake for me in thinking from within the point de fixation is to counter the consequences of activist anxiety at the way its object, its fixation if you want, that is the right to mobility or to asylum, is endangered by the scourge of crack. Ce n'est pas notre problème, ce n'est pas notre public. Ashley's foregrounding of the concept of, indesirability, of undesirability is also vital here and his recent observations that today in France, what can be treated as la merde, displaced, dispersed, walled in and criminalized, are an ever-growing number of people identified for an increasing range of misdemeanors. While, of course, la merde is also and always a euphemism for race. Equally significant and blocked is the claim, we're here because they are here. Looser in its categorization, it establishes a dynamic of simple reactivity that cancels the complexity that is at stake in mapping the territory of Europe otherwise, including its reach beyond its continental landmass. Mass. My point is not to contest the countless testimonies in which people have described the impulse to action prompted by an encounter with people on the move in desperately penalizing conditions but to suggest that if the answer to the accusation of fixing migrants, perhaps for putative political gain, as is the motive invoked in the criminalization of solidarity networks, if the answer to the accusation of fixing is to invoke the principle of the unconditionality of welcome, then what binds people to an action? 
what makes for the specificity of their action in that place and the pasts and the futures carried with it tends to get collapsed under a categorical imperative. Asking both what gets occluded or surreptitiously imported when a point de fixation is declared reveals then how the lines of passive victims and active subjects continue to structure the terms of our understanding. It conjures the negativity of obstructed agency and the moral obligation of individual action. If I had time for a longer genealogy of the expression itself, I would plot back to Louis Vacan's work on Chicago and the Paris banlieue in particular, to the way territorial stigmatization fastens on to certain social forms and doubles down on them, and to how the stigmatization becomes a question of will, either the good will that gets you out or the failed will that results in bad attachments. The same stakes operate in the point de fixation today as it breaks out of the ghetto and into a whole range of new spaces. And I want to suggest in a more limited frame that one of the possibilities that this fixed locution affords us, particularly in the ultra-dense and intermediary space of La Chapelle, between the traditional city and the relegated spaces of the banlieue, are the means to articulate the complex relations between post-colonial disqualification and the racializing criminalization of migrants. But I'll hold that thought for a moment. Because I want not only to loosen the point de fixation to find its earlier structuration, but also to claim that in its fitness, fixedness, it offers another sort of consistency that is useful for us that for all its negative affect, it is a resource for grasping the contours of new collective formations. The point de fixation belongs in this sense within a growing repertoire of resources for thinking political practices that others have described as border work or as erupting in convulsive spaces of autonomous migrant incorrigibility resulting in patchy, clustering spatialities of the struggle fields of contemporary migration. And I'm giving you some of the references for this great work that has been, in, I think, is very enlivening for our understanding of the multiplicity of borders <coughs> that striate the continent of Europe and beyond. And I'm drawing on this work here. Along with work that is less evidently tied to the border as such, including the cramped space that Nicholas Thoburn builds out of Deleuze and Guattari as a nexus of intensified constraints and commands that bear upon lives interlaced with and buffeted by global social relations. Or the friction that Anand Singh describes as sticky engagements or awkward, unequal, unstable and creative qualities of interconnection across difference. And I think that's a kind of great formulation to think with. <coughs> but there's a danger in wanting to do too much. To open this moment, this paper, in a multiplicity of directions, forward-facing, but also reflective of work accomplished, of questions still persistent and structuring. This too is, I think, the condition of the point de fixation. The cluster of factors that command attention, the possibility of being overwhelmed yet still consenting to turn up and keep going. In this sense, the second configuration or pitch that I have to offer of the point de fixation is also an experience of blocked perception, less structured as a blind spot as in the aporia of accusation, counteract accusation, and more as an excess, which for the purposes of time, I'll make visual. Now, they're both attempting, so this, these are both quite old as documents. This one's from 2016. Let's see if we can pull it down so we can actually see there rather than some silly ad. Let's see the map. Okay, so this is it. So you can see where we are. It's a relatively straightforward map, but the main reason for using it is because it has a little mobile thing on it which pops up lots of little bubbles of camps, okay, that pop up all over the map. And, and then the other one has, again, the same sorts of bubbles. And, um, and both of these maps are attempting to show sort of vectors of change. The, the point of them, perhaps this will be clearer on this one. Okay. 
Yeah, okay, this one does it. This is more static, so it's easier to use. But you can see that what they're doing as well um, is using these bubbles with these numbers, and they've got different sized bubbles for different, for different numbers, okay? And um, this one, which you probably can't see very well on the size of the screen as well, is also trying to show that while there's a very clear point de fixation, you've got this kind of overlaying of all these camps in the same area. And I'll come back briefly to this map in a minute, but obviously there's all sorts of mobility, right? The lines of people walking primarily to different places in the city, but constantly kind of returning to this spot. Um, these map, the two maps that you saw, and I, you know, you can find the links here if you type in the, the, the things, the titles, you'll see that the one in Le Monde is really quite interesting. But they're from really short periods of time, and they are already like four years old, and there's been obviously just a continuous succession of camps since that time. Now if I'm showing them, if I wanted to use them in this context, it's because I think they sit on the frontier between signifying, quite simply, excess, or the trop plein, the too much of wasted lives while they also point to the fragmentation into different scenes contained discreetly in the bubbles of intensity. In this respect, they allow me to situate two other traps that lie around us. The constant display of the camp as a scene of exponential impossibility and, on the other hand, what we might call the containerization of the point de fixation into a set of discrete factors such as we have seen just very recently or over the past few months as the, uh, in the context of that hyperstatization or that kind of constituting as object of the so-called supermarché de crack in the corner of the Rue d'Aubervilliers and the Rue de Riquet, which for all its catastrophic singularity in the landscape is also deeply woven into the fabric of La Chapelle. To get into the cramped stickiness that Singh refers to, we need to know how the sedimentation of transient configurations of displaced, displaced people, both on the move and held in limbo, intersect with other sedimentations of struggles for the right to housing, to a clean environment, to labor rights, to political representation. So I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna to point to a few things which you can't really read at all here, so it's not very effective, but right here is also some famous landmarks that some of you will know of, the Église Saint-Bernard, which I will refer to brief, uh, briefly in a minute, which was the scene in the, in the mid-1990s of one of the big uh, undocumented workers' occupations. But we don't have to go very far away, just as well onto here, where you've got one of the other really important um, occupations <coughs> that went on for a long, long time on the Rue Bourlic, um, there, and, and another thing that I want to refer to here, which is just quite simply the Association des Travailleurs Maghrébins de France, which is literally about maybe a hundred meters away from the Église Saint-Bernard, but almost never referred to in the literature in relation to the Église Saint-Bernard. And the Association des Travailleurs Maghrébins de France is an organization that dates right back to the Algerian independence movement and has been extremely important both in defending political rights um, and labor rights for uh, North African workers in France, but increasingly in recent years to providing all sorts of legal and, um, and sort of translational uh, support in particular for people from Somalia, Eritrea, Sudan, and so on. Okay? So those two institutions, I'll, I'll refer back to them in just a minute. So these are the sort of other factors, if you like. Okay, that are there. These are the other sedimentations that I think we need to think about. The crack encampment that has reduced the conditions of social life in one part of one of the richest cities in the world to new lows was unquestionably fixed on the corner of the Rue d'Aubervilliers by the actions of the state and the local authorities, enthralled by their capacities to antagonize one another, and by a deeply embedded use of police intimidation and also by the extreme inequalities of gentrification in a zone as dense and historic as La Chapelle, where money washes around the worst states of deprivation. But it is not a coincidence either that the area bristles too with the forms and histories of solidarity, with squats and occupied green and brown spaces, that the adjoining park was the result of a long struggle against toxic waste and overcrowding, all of this, and far more than I can express here, attaches to the point de fixation. So to move towards a conclusion that I also want to be a beginning, 
because that's what this is process and this moment are about. It's the start of a new year. It's a total pleasure to feel the long and deep attachments to people and work here and all the new faces and all the new possibilities. But also because the work around the distributions and mobilizations in La Chapelle, for all their fixation on staying the distance, on not missing a day, not giving an inch, is also always about imagining that it could stop and become something else. Le monde d'après. I'll be schematic to finish because I've already been long. So what does the locution and the locus of the point de fixation offer us within a dense field of inquiry, itself striated by terminology and distinction? First, in contrast to some significant propositions within critical migration studies to reconceptualize migrant political subjectivities, positing an inassimilable vitality or autonomy, a focus on the point de fixation de-essentializes migration, offsets the question of agency, turns our attention to unstable collective formations articulated across time and condition, connecting post-colonial actors, such as that Association des Travailleurs Maghrébin de France, with its inscription in Algerian independence, to multiple faith-based actors, such as the Saint Bernard Church and the nearby mosques to numerically insignificant collectives of maybe just a few people, as well as organizations and non-state actors and people whose scale is properly continental. It enables us, I think, the point de fixation to articulate rehearsal or répétition and performance or performativity, practice and event, to engage with postures other than resistance or struggle to access the extent to which habit, affinity, compulsion also attach us to spaces that tax us and transform us. It allows us to describe what Michel Kukorev has recently described as the Diagonale de la Rage, a largely invisible history of localized and often sustained clusters of determination and solidarity, marked too by sporadic periods of repression and heightened visibility and intensity which cut across divisions between sedentariness and mobility and begin to articulate more productively the spaces at the border with, for example, the zone à défendre, two alternative loci of concentrated, spatialized disobedience or point de fixation. In a recent article, and drawing on Scots against the grain, Engenheis <coughs> points, up, he points up the persistent interwovenness of concepts of people, sedentariness, and the boundedness of territory. He argues, in ways that I draw from, in intellectual affinity and friendship, that it is time today not for suspending geographical reference in a rethinking of collective political subjectivities, but for thinking peoples with geographies that reflect non-bounded configurations, such as peoples without permanent address, without papers, without property. And I want to think of the point de fixation as a geography of this type, a mobile territory, an address that has a consistency without bureaucratic attributes. And also that those, all those who are fixated by the point de fixation as the people of the point de fixation, what would it mean to map this geography? Well, there have been so many interesting cartographic experiments, experimentations aiming to reconfigure the landscape of our contemporary disquiet and its impasses. So I hesitate to define a horizon of work by such a question. But I think such a horizon has to imagine something of that order. A mapping of our persistent but unbordered attachments, located but unanchored, a cohesiveness that is subject to change, a force but not an asset of any one person or group. And for my part, I think it is with the practices of language, in something like fixed locutions in particular, with their cluttered opacity, their antagonistic potential, their possible opening towards new forms of listening and speaking that this mapping has to, do, has to be done. This last step is a leap, but it doesn't take me very far from the Rue de Bervilliers and the distribution with its rituals and its tables, 
its dances and its calls, line, line, and all sorts of other forms of life that gather around it, from inter-associative politics to its pigeons, its starlings, its crows, and even its herons. In her work on living in oiseau, habité en oiseau, an exploration of how the observation of bird life and particularly the listening to birdsong augments our conception of territory with considerations far beyond a fear of scarcity and a need to ensure the inviolability or security of one's property. Vincien Despret proposes to envisage territories as generative of uh, social relations, as having, she says, une fonction instauratrice. In the cacophony of this moment, as seen from La Chapelle this weekend, en passant par les Invalides, I would like to think that the discord over the point de fixation has an inaugural capacity. Mm -hmm. <laughs>